So, so welcome, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to invite everyone here to the, the, this Higgs lecture um, this evening, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have a great uh, talk by David Gross uh, to keep us on our toes and thinking hard. Um, I just want to say just a few words about the, the Higgs lecture. It's a, it's a faculty lecture, and I'm acting as the, as the dean currently. Um, and the Higgs lecture was um, set up in 2012 um, in honor of, of Peter Higgs. Um, and Peter Higgs um, uh, uh, was, was an undergraduate and then a PhD student at King's and then spent his uh, later career uh, at Edinburgh. Um, and of course, um, Higgs is, uh, you know, in the 60s, um, did the work that predicted the Higgs boson, which was subsequently uh, discovered in uh, 2012 uh, at CERN. Uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, prize followed in 2013 and Higgs came and gave the first of these Higgs lectures at that time um, and the Higgs lectures run annually ever since as a faculty lecture we've had a range of uh, different uh, sort of very esteemed uh, speakers over that time um, and this is actually the 10th Higgs lecture because we didn't run um, in 2020 and 2021 for rather obvious uh, reasons um, so it's really fantastic to, to get this series going, uh, going again, and it was sort of reinitiated last year um, with uh, Roger Penrose, another Nobel Prize winner in physics, um, who came uh, and talked to us uh, last year. So um, I really want to be brief, um, say welcome everyone, um, welcome David, um, I'm sure we can have a great evening, and I'll hand over to Nadav who's going to introduce our very esteemed speaker. Yes, welcome. Uh, my name is Nadav Drucker. I'm the head of the theoretical physics group in the mathematics department, and I co-organized this event with Malcolm Fairbein, my colleague from the physics department. And uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Professor David Gross, who's uh, the chancellor chair uh, professor at the Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Professor Gross got his undergraduate degree at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, did his PhD at Berkeley, and after a postdoc at Harvard, went to Princeton, where um, he did a lot of research, but what he will tell us about today is a paper that uh, was published 50 years ago, almost to the day, about a confinement of uh, quarks and QCD. I won't steal your talk. You will explain it to us. And uh, then he went to continue to study many other things, including string theory, uh, matrix models, and made very important uh, discoveries in those fields. Uh, I got to know, I heard of the name of, uh, of David Gross when I was an undergraduate student at the Hebrew University. And I asked my a personal tutor, what should I do for my career? And he said, we had a student here once. Uh, you should go to Princeton and do your PhD with him, which is somehow what I ended up doing. Um, a lesson to the undergraduates here, go talk to your personal tutor. Maybe they have good advice for you. <laughs> At the time that I started working uh, with Professor Gross, uh, he moved to the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, and I followed him, where he took on the directorship of the uh, Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics, and in addition to his uh, research career, added another side of uh, academic and research management, and uh, turned the Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics to the leading uh, institute in the world uh, in, in research and theoretical physics, and as a manager kept emphasizing the importance of research and a collaboration and bringing people together and so on. And since then, he has been a, a leading advocate of that and is on the board of many uh, other similar institutes that try to emulate the success of the institute uh, he chaired. Um, Professor Gross is still active in research. 
he, uh, he, he still writes research papers, and one of his recent uh, collaborators has actually uh, joined us here uh, for the last two days, where uh, he also joined us for a small workshop that we organized on themes that interest him, and he was a very active participant, and they were sitting at lunch and calculating things, and um, it was a, a pleasure uh, to see and a pleasure for our students to see uh, how research uh, is still done. Um, and yeah, so as I mentioned his uh, academic management, he was, in addition to the head of the KITP, he was uh, the president of American uh, Physical Society and he's a member of all kinds of uh, important organizations. He won uh, several prizes. I cannot list all of them. I'll mention the Sakurai Prize, the um, Dirac Medal, the a MacArthur Fellowship, the Grand Medaillé d'Or, uh, oh, and uh, the Nobel Prize in 2004. <laughs> uh, I took already enough of your time, but uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Gross to give the Higgs lecture. Mm. Thank you, Nada. Uh, can you hear me? No problem. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I've had a lovely two days in this beautiful part of London and uh, really enjoyed the, the workshop and the very alive and um, group that you have here. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure. And um, I'm going to. Uh, mark a 50th anniversary, indeed, of quantum chromodynamics, as as not have said, um, the seminal papers were indeed received by PRL almost exactly 50 years ago to date. And sort of that's, we're celebrating 50 years of the theory of the strong nuclear force, which I must say, 50 years ago was the, roughly the 50th anniversary of quantum mechanics. And to me at the time, 50 years sounded like an infinite amount of time. My god, I couldn't imagine what it was like 50 years before. And now we're 50 years later, 100 years of quantum mechanics. Um, now, I imagine that most of the audience was not alive 50 years ago, right? Uh, those of you who were al not alive 50 years ago, could you raise your hand? Yes, I'm right, almost all the audience. So 50 years must seem like infinity. And like most physicists, young physicists, you know almost nothing about the history of physics, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it's really interesting. And you'll learn a lot about truly studying the history of physics, which isn't the story you read in the textbooks. It's full of mistakes and errors, and, and it's fascinating. So I urge you to, and I'll, I'll try to fill in a few holes. Actually, I'm going to start going back even earlier, uh, 60 years ago, when both the study of the nucleus of atoms, as well as experimental high-energy physics, really began with Rutherford, uh, who in 1911 essentially discovered the nucleus and invented high-energy experimental physics. I'm not sure which is more important. What he did, of course, was to probe the structure of atoms by colliding alpha particles, which he had you know, famously uh, studied in radioactive decay. They provided uh, a beam, if you want, of particles, which he threw at a gold foil to see what would happen and thereby see what the atom was made out of. At that point, really, nobody had a good idea. Um, and his students, undergraduate, postdoc, sat in a dark room and 
observe the deflected uh, alpha particles on a fluorescent screen. And Rutherford was rather surprised that a lot of the particles, the alpha particles, came back at large angle scattering. Um, that was unexpected. Atom was a diffuse object that you would expect very few particles could actually bounce off what Rutherford concluded was a very small region of space where all the mass and the positive charge of the atom was located, otherwise known as the nucleus. And he concluded that the atom sort of looked like this. There were electrons defining the size of the atom, but the mass and the positive charge was located in a region he couldn't actually measure, but he did put a, a uh, upper bound on how big it could be. It was very small, about one part in a hundred thousand of the size of the atom. And that, of course, began nuclear physics, the study of the nucleus of atoms. It took another almost 20 years before the nu neutron was discovered. Rutherford, in effect, discovered the proton. Chadwick, the neutron, but it was slow going. Most importantly, however, what Rutherford invented was the way we do experimental high energy particle physics. In order to probe the structure of matter, we collide particles together, protons today on protons, protons on a fixed target in those days. Now, the LHC, we collide protons <laughs> on protons, and we see what comes out. And we don't use fluorescent screens as Rutherford did, but these amazing uh, detectors. Now, that has been the way we do particle physics for the last 110 years. And in a sense, we have not done better than Rutherford. We don't, haven't figured out by and large, any other way of probing matter at shorter and shorter distances. We have lots of indirect ways, but the primary tool that has led to our deep and thorough understanding of uh, atoms originally and then nuclei and subnuclei uh, has been using Rutherford's technique. Perhaps we need a new way of probing shorter distances. We seem to be approaching the limit of what we can build and afford. So when I started graduate school uh, in the 60s uh, at Berkeley, that was the LHC of the time. It was the largest high energy uh, facility in the world. Six GV, one, part, one thousandth of what we do now. But uh, very exciting. Particles were being, new particles were being discovered every few weeks. And the theory was almost non-existent. The strong force was especially intractable. At that time, it was already realized there were two kinds of forces acting within the nucleus. The strong force, because it was very strong, that held the nucleons together, and the weak force, the weak interactions that gave rise to radioactivity. The strong force was especially intractable for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, which particles were elementary? What are the basic, I mean, the search since Democrates was for the basic constituents of matter. And originally, it was thought when the proton, neutron were discovered that they were the elementary constituents of the nucleus. And Yukawa invented a massive particle that could transmit a short-range nuclear force, which coupled strongly to the neutrons and the protons. The pi meson was discovered. And so that was a beginning of nuclear theory, if you want. On the other hand, there was no principle known that could dictate the dynamics how these particles interacted. <laughs> and furthermore, the coupling of these particles, the strength of the force, 
uh, was not small like it is in electrodynamics, quantum electrodynamics, a very successful quantum field theory of electromagnetism, but rather big. And so perturbation theory was not useful. So nobody knew what the constituents really were. New particles are being discovered all the time. They seemed identical, you know, similar to protons and neutrons, and there were more and more of them, dozens and dozens. So which were the elementary particles from which the other particles were uh, constructed? What was the principle that determined the dynamics and how to calculate? Dyson, so far our heroes are all English, uh, who made such fundamental contributions to the quantum theory of electromagnetism, tried very hard to construct a quantum field theory of the nuclear force and failed miserably and gave up and said the correct theory will not be found in a hundred years in 1960, uh, which is 63 years ago. And indeed, it only took a, a decade or so. But the impression that when I was in graduate school was that some kind of revolution was needed, some kind of truly new idea beyond simply quantizing a classical, perhaps, field theory of, of uh, nuclear particles. And in retrospect, we understand why this problem was so difficult. It's because the basic charges that are the source of the strong nuclear force of quantum chromodynamics, the color of quarks and gluons that source the chromodynamic field, like the electric charge sources the electromagnetic field, were completely hidden. You couldn't see them. No matter how you smashed what energy continually increasing over the decades, you smashed protons together. Lots of new particles came out, but never fractionally charged quarks. So the constituents, the elementary particles, unlike the electron, um, could not be produced in the lab. They were completely hidden. When they were invented, as possible ways of understanding the pattern of symmetries of hadrons, of strongly interacting particles, uh, it wasn't clear that they were more than they had any physical meaning beyond mathematical uh, devices to summarize the symmetries. And the theoretical framework was ill understood. The theoretical framework, soon after the development of quantum mechanics, for relativistic quantum mechanics was quantum field theory. And the great success of quantum field theory originally was the quantized theory of Maxwell's uh, theory of electromagnetism. But an essential part of that development in the 50s <coughs> was renormalization theory, and it was truly not understood. It was thought by the inventors of that theory and by and large to be a trick. It was sweeping infinities under the rug somehow. It was not understood in a physical fashion. And it was one of the reasons people thought that some kind of revolution was truly needed. Furthermore, uh, quantum field theory consisted at the time of perturbation theory. One expanded, tried to calculate, assuming there was a small coupling like there is in QED. <laughs> Field theory, I was taught by Steve Weinberg in the first course I took on quantum field theory. He wrote, the beginning of the course, field theory equals Feynman diagrams. That be really because he, I'm not sure he really believed it, but there certainly were no other uh, non-perturbative methods. There was a very successful theory, if you want, or model of the weak interactions. 
that explain beta decay, other radioactive decays, and so on. Uh, and it was moderately successful. But how to turn it into a real theory and calculate quantum corrections to the Born approximation, uh, nobody knew. Didn't seem to be susceptible to the program of renormalization, making sense out of it to all orders and the coupling. Coupling was weak at low energy, so one could calculate very successfully. The theory that turned out to be the source of uh, the nuclear forces, Yang-Mills theory, non-abelian gauge theory, where the sources, the gauge symmetry is not abelian as it is in Maxwell's theory, but non-abelian, uh, was plagued with massless bosons. Uh, not the analogs of photons. But there were no massless bosons, uh, non-abelian gauge bosons in the real world. And nobody until Higgs and others uh, solved that problem. And furthermore, the first applications, you had to couple, the, had to have conserved charges. The only charges one knew about were what we call today flavor charges or flavor symmetries which are not exact symmetries. They're approximate symmetries. And it actually makes no sense to couple, to gauge broken accidental symmetries as we now understand them. So it was a mess. The, in addition, <laughs> there was a serious attack by theorists who were pursuing especially the strong interactions quantum field theory as a framework, as a conceptual framework for understanding relativistic quantum mechanics. <laughs> My advisor, Jeffrey Chu, led that movement in the, on the west coast of the United States uh, with two principles which he pushed very strongly. One was he called nuclear democracy. He's very good at catchphrases. Nuclear democracy, all particles all hadrons are equally fundamental. You could imagine that, say, uh, the new particles were bound states of protons and neutrons and pions, Yukawa's meson, or vice versa. The pion was a bound state of nucleons and antinucleons. There was no reason why you should just pick out a few of these many, many hadrons as fundamental and say the others are composites. But then how are you going to write down a theory if you don't have fundamental constituents? Well, the answer was the bootstrap. It was so hard to construct a sensible quantum field theory and find exact solutions that you began to distrust whether there are any consistent S matrices, scattering amplitudes, which is what you observe involving um, <coughs> nucleons. So the idea was, well, let's start with general principles which we believe in, even if quantum field theory makes no sense, like unitarity, the conservation of probability, and analyticity, which embodies causality, and then try to construct a, a S matrix, scattering amplitudes, which you observe, that satisfy these general principles. And since it's so difficult, an answer must be unique. That was the idea. This bootstrap approach, by the way, of course, has <coughs> um, been revived with some very interesting developments in modern times. I think, it actually, historically, it was very lucky that we didn't have powerful computers back then, because then people could have pushed the bootstrap program a lot further than they were able to. And that wasn't the way to go, as it turned out. In Russia, in the Soviet Union, there was a, another attack on quantum field theory. And it was led by Landau, who controlled physics in the Soviet Union like no one possibly can imagine in the West. And he and his collaborators studied, tried to understand renormalization in physical terms. And concluded that 
Quantum field theory had a disastrous problem, which sometimes is known as the Landau pull. And what it essentially they concluded was that in all theories they studied, especially QED, the physical coupling that you measure, the fine structure constant, 1 over 137, vanishes no matter how small, no matter how large, you make the bare coupling that defines the theory at point-like distances, at arbitrarily short distances. So you introduce some kind of cutoff or short distance cutoff and calculate the physical coupling that you measure as a function of the input bare coupling, so-called bare coupling, and then you let the cutoff go to infinity, physical coupling vanishes. Now, this conclusion was based on a very simple assumption that lowest order perturbation theory iterated made sense. Uh, was the answer, but it essentially is correct. And the physical phenomena here, uh, <coughs> this behavior of the coupling as a function of scale, uh, is due to a phenomena that we're, we all know very well, classically and quantum mechanically, called screening. So in a relativistic quantum field theory, the vacuum is not empty, it's filled with virtual pairs of particles that can be produced and annihilate uh, in a short time. And so you should always think of the vacuum as a medium with dipoles. Uh, and a, such a dielectric medium screens a charge that you put into the vacuum. It, the vacuum is a medium with virtual dipoles. And those dipoles screen the charge. So you put the charge in, and it gets screened. <laughs> now, consequ immediate consequence of that is that the electric force that this charge gives rise to decreases at large distances, because there's more screening, more of the medium to screen. And conversely, increases at short distances because there's less screening. That's the opposite of what we call asymptotic freedom. And such a phenomena is true for all non-asymptotically free theories, like QCD. And Landau concluded boldly. He, Landau was always bold. He said, we reached the conclusion that within the limits of formal electrodynamics, a point interaction, so really saying that there's a point interaction where an electron emits a photon. For any intensity whatever, no matter how you adjust the coupling at arbitrarily short distances, is equivalent to no interaction at all. The physical coupling vanishes. And so he's driven to the conclusion that the Hamiltonian method, or quantum field theory, uh, for strong interactions is dead and must be buried, although, of course, with deserved honor. Now, he said the strong interaction because this problem already occurs in QED, and QED by itself is probably an inconsistent theory. We all, many of us believe that. Hasn't been proven. Surely true. But that problem arises at this Landau pole arises at incredibly high energies, and any rational per person could ignore that problem. You might have to include gravity, who knows? But for the strong interactions, it occurs at very low energies if you assume the same kind of behavior. So Landau forbade young students, postdocs, and even senior colleagues to work on quantum field theory. So much so that colleagues, my young colleagues at like Poliko, Migdal, et cetera, people like that, had to pretend they were doing condensed matter physics in order to do quantum field theory. However, experiment was thriving. 
There were an incredible number of experiments, unlike today, sort of the opposite situation. Theory was impotent, experiment was king. There were new discoveries every few weeks, new particles, new patterns of particles. <coughs> and people were scattering, hitting protons off protons or antiprotons at higher and higher energies. Again, however, the experimenters were slightly misled in the following way. When you scatter high energy particles, most of the events go in the forward direction. Particles are scattered, but they don't deviate that much. There are showers of particles in the forward direction. That's where most of the cross section is. Furthermore, theorists had uh, discovered very interesting regularities in this so-called diffraction or forward scattering, scattering, Reggie theory, Reggie pulse. So the theorist said, that's where you should look, high energy forward scattering. Experimenter said, that's great, because most of the data is there anyway, get better statistics. <laughs> and very few people, if any, were interested in the high momentum transfer. The thing that Rutherford discovered, that sometimes the particles, the constituents, come back at you. Large momentum transfer, which turned out to be the region where the secret of the strong interactions were. <laughs> now, I escaped from Berkeley and from Chu, and because I thought the bootstrap was roughly you know, right-hand side equals left. You know, there's no, no input. You just confirm that the sacred principles you believed in could be true. And uh, currents that generated these approximate symmetries of the uh, strong interactions were operators unlike the fields themselves, were things you could actually measure. And so their properties were of great interest. And using totally um, illegitimate means, the game was, at that time, to assume various properties of these currents, such as we now call the operator product expansion. And uh, we could use these without thinking or try to evaluate the singularities that arise using free field theory, which made no sense. But still, you could derive some rules, relations, that could be tested experimentally. And unlike today's theoretical physics, where experiments are so powerful and theory is equally powerful, uh, you could derive illegitimate sum rules and then ask the experimentalist to test them. Nowadays, it's really hard to make precise pre speculative predictions, as we have learned. Uh, one of these that Callan and I derived uh, suggested Bjorkain looked at this and said, well, this sort of implies scaling, that the structure function, which can be measured in electron-proton scattering, can be uh, is just a function of ratios, dimensional analysis, if you want, or. And then Callan and I also derived some other sum rules, which indicated that these same kinds of cross-sections um, exhibited regularities which had to do with the uh, spin of the constituents. And in particular, we showed that if you assume and use these illegitimate techniques that the constituents are spin one half, then you get a particular uh, result that the longitudinal transverse polarized photon nucleon scattering would vanish. 
So this was the game. And therefore, I was very interested in the end of the 60s, 1968, when Slack uh, opened its uh, high energy electron fixed target proton experiment, which could probe the structure of the nucleon, essentially in the same way that Rutherford did. Scatter electrons, not protons, electrons off protons. You know how electrons interact with whatever it is inside the proton that has charge. And then you look at what comes out, especially in the backward direction, or at large angles. Nobody really wanted to do this experiment. It was boring. That wasn't where the real secret of strong interactions was. That was in diffraction scattering, Reggie behavior. The people who did, uh, however, of course, won the Nobel Prize for discovering quarks because it looked with big arrows, uh, with rosy colored eyes, that these experiments indicated that the proton looked like it was made out of freely moving point-like particles. And not only that, the quark model sum rules, for example, the spin one-half sum rule, worked approximately. And Friedman, Kendall, and Taylor, who did this experiment, uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering seen quarks, the same way Rutherford saw the nucleus of atoms. But this was very confusing. <laughs> the experiments and the fact that some of the sum rules that I wrote down worked convinced me that hadrons were made out of point-like constituents, freely moving objects. Not only that, the charged constituents, the things the photons interacted with, were quarks. They had the right spin. With neutrino scattering, one could verify their baryon number, one third, et cetera, et cetera. They were all, they looked like quarks. So quarks, which had been invented to describe the pattern of flavor symmetries, were not just mathematical devices, but real. But how could that possibly be? Because quarks didn't, you could never kick the quarks out of the nucleus. So what held them in? It had to be some very strong force. You could not ionize a proton. But if it was a strong force, then they wouldn't look like point-like constituents. They'd have some structure, just like the nucleon does. So quarks must interact strongly. And then you could not explain scaling. You couldn't explain the sum rules. You couldn't explain anything. So but the scaling seemed to be with roughly 10, 15, 20% errors at the time. You could ignore, therefore, the experiments. Many did. But if you believe them, then somehow you got this point-like behavior. There was no scale. In uh, in quantum field theory, which violates quantum <coughs> effects, destroyed naive scale invariants. We already saw that with screening. The electric force is because of the screening properties of the vacuum, depends on the scale you probe it. Gets stronger at short distances, weaker at large distances, more screening. So that was the conundrum that obsessed me for about five years. And except for a detour into string theory, which started roughly at the same time, um, I was obsessed with this problem. And by the way, and many of my theorists who were, like Ken Wilson, for example, who really revolutionized our way of thinking about quantum field theory 
both the operator product expansion, renormalization group theory, uh, were due to him, uh, believed the experiments were probably misleading. And if you went to higher energy, things would become more complicated as he expected. Strings could not explain this. Strings were soft. They weren't point-like at all. They're extended objects from the beginning. They could not explain scaling. <laughs> so by 1972, I developed a plan, a program. And the plan was to destroy quantum field theory for good. And the first part of that plan was to prove that if you really took the experiment seriously, point-like constituents or scaling, then you acquired what we call asymptotic freedom. This phenomena that as you go to shorter and shorter distances, the strength of the coupling changes. And to get the point-like free behavior at short distances, you would need that the coupling approach zero. And generalizing uh, discussion an observation by Parisi, Callan, and I showed that that was the case for all renormalizable sensible theories, except non abelian gauge theories, which we didn't study, where this, we couldn't prove this theorem, which isn't even true. For, although you do get asymptotic freedom for non abelian gauge theories. Anyway, that was the first part. You needed asymptotic freedom to explain the experiments. He took them seriously. And second was the idea was to show that there aren't any asymptotically free theories. And this, in a sense, is straightforward, because if a theory is asymptotically free, then at very short distances, high energies, the coupling gets weaker and weaker. So you can do perturbation theory, and that's straightforward. And you can see if you get a contradiction. <laughs> and that was expected just like Landau expected, based on QED, the charge renormalization, there's variation with distance, is screening. So the coupling should vanish. Uh, sorry, the coupling, it's wrong, should not, right, should blow up as you go to short distances. Replace this zero by infinity, oops. Oops, plan. So anyway, we could easily study whether a theory is asymptotically free or not by perturbation theory. And with Callan, the same year, 1973, Coleman and I proved that there are no sensible theory. Sensible theory, for example, is one that has a vacuum that doesn't just fall apart. With any number of scalar particles, or spin one half particles, or abelian gauge particles, uh, with arbitrary interaction, is asymptotically free. That was called the price of asymptotic freedom. And so the plan was almost accomplished. There was only one theory, which we didn't study either here or there, because it was new and fresh, and that was not abelian gauge theories, which had been, that Hooft and Veltman had shown were renormalizable. You could make sense out of perturbation theory. You could calculate, but it was very unfamiliar. And at that point, I had my first graduate student at Princeton, Frank Wilche. And here's Frank, and he still had hair. Just a secret, this is a wig. <laughs> After our discovery, when he felt confident, one day he suddenly appears without the wig. Looks like he does today. And we discovered that, my God, you know, I brought him in, like all my graduate students, I like to work with them, they're colleagues. That's the way to really teach students is to Anyway, uh, we discovered, this was 50 years ago, three weeks ago, that 
Non-abelian gauge theories are totally different, just the opposite. But they are, have the remarkable feature, perhaps unique, is, is actually unique, four dimensions, of asymptotically approaching free field theory. And that should provide, therefore, one should look for a non-abelian, say it again, a non-abelian gauge theory of the strong interactions to explain Burkane scaling. So the upshot was I didn't succeed, thank God, in killing quantum field theory. I did succeed in killing all other quantum field theories aside from non-abelian gauge theory, which kind of miraculous. And not only that, it's clear in that already that the dynamics, well, if you took the experiment seriously, the dynamics had to be non-abelian gauge theories. Gluons were the, the quanta of the non-abelian gauge field were the stuff that glued the quarks together. The matter was made out of quarks. Couldn't have scalars. That's not asymptotically free. And so the dynamics was fixed by what we already knew. We knew quite a bit phenomenologically about the strong interactions. And one particular appealing model, just an understatement in a way, based on three triplets of fermions, three because there have been three flavors, we now call them up and down and strange quarks. There are three other flavors, but they hadn't yet been discovered. With an SU3, color had already been discovered by Han and Bu uh, in order to explain, if you assume that hadrons are made out of quarks, you want to explain the statistics, spin statistics, you needed three, <laughs> a degeneracy of three. And so there are obvious charges for a uh, non-abelian gauge theory. And that is otherwise known as QCD. Now, why is QCD different? It doesn't exhibit screening. It exhibits anti-screening. And there's a very simple physical understanding of that, from, not from an electric point of view, but from a magnetic point of view. You, know, you can think of any gauge theory, both in terms of electric charges or their dual magnetic charges. From a magnetic point of view, uh, the vacuum is filled with these dipoles, all right, which screen, but it's also filled with these spin one gluons, which are produced in pairs, just like uh, gluons carry color, so they can, be, they're strongly, in, well, they're interacting, and they can be produced in the vacuum, and they're permanent dipoles, permanent magnets. So instead of getting diamagnetism, which you would get in QED from a magnetic point of view, you get paramagnetism. If you put in a magnet, a little permanent magnet, and then measure the magnetic field, it will depend on distance. But now, because the little permanent magnets align, the opposite happens. As long as there isn't too much screening, if you don't have too many elect quarks or charged particles, the QCD force decreases at short distances because there's less anti-screening and increases at large distances, just the opposite. <laughs> that physical picture, of course, uh, was only understood after the fact. And Landau could have figured this out. Uh, why not? In our longer version of the paper, we started deriving, since you can use perturbation theory at large energy, short distances, you can do a lot of calculations. Immediately, we started doing those. But most pressing was the question, what happens at large distances, where the coupling increases. 
And we hypothesized that the consequence of this is that quarks can never get out of the nucleus. Now, at first sight, this would appear to be ridiculous. Anyway, but uh, we said it might very well be that this infrared behavior is such to suppress as states that you can produce in collisions, all but color singlet states, neutral states. And the colored gauge fields, as well as the quarks, although we could see them at slack at short distances, they could never be produced as real particles. Now, that conjecture uh, is still not proved by any means, but we have absolute confidence that it's correct. First of all, experiment has never produced quarks, even when you smash protons together at trillion electron volts. And second, we have a numerical control over what happens at large distances using lattice gauge theory. And the picture is quite simple. So let's calculate the force between two charged objects. Well, in a theory like electromagnetism, you do that by using Gauss's law. That's all you need to know. The electric field integrated over the area of a sphere, say, surrounding the positive charge gives you the charge. It's Gauss's theorem. And therefore, the charge, the electric field, falls off, as Coulomb said, like 1 over distance squared. And therefore, to separate the charged particles, you have to do work. You integrate uh, EDR. And the energy of the separated particles by distance r falls, increases. Of course, it takes work to pull the particles apart. But it saturates. And eventually, you can ionize the atom pull the electrons out, make them run in wires, do work for you, perfect. But in quantum chromodynamics, the strong force is also mediated by a gauge field. Classically, it would be very similar to electromagnetism. However, we just said the vacuum is non-trivial. It's filled with fluctuating fields. It's a medium. And this medium, this anti-screening medium, doesn't like to have these flux lines present. And what happens is that these flux lines are squeezed into a tube, flux tube it's called. <coughs> and there's some area of that flux tube. It can't be squeezed to zero. That would make no sense. But let's say it's squeezed to a constant uh, thickness. Now, if you apply Gauss's law, what happens is that E times the area of the flux tube equals the charge. There's no flux out here. So the electric field, the force between the up quark and a down quark, for example, is constant no matter how far you pull them apart. And if you integrate a constant force, the energy that's required grows linearly. So it would require an infinite amount of energy to ionize the meson, in this case, or the proton. That's confinement. <coughs> that's not been proved. It could be false, but it isn't. And one of the reasons we believe that is that we can solve QCD numerically. And this is what the meson looks like if you pull the quark away from the anti-quark. You see the flux lines. They're indeed confined in this flux tube. Actually, uh, you also see a fat string here, which connects to the next part of my talk. Well, I'm going to go through this history very rapidly. It's a law of 50 years. A lot had happened. QCD was a, a remarkably accepted immediately by all the people 
I therefore thereafter regard it as smart. <laughs> I'm not sure. John, should you be on this list? I think so, right? What? Halfway. halfway. <laughs> John is half smart. It was immediate for a small group of people. But, you know, you didn't have to, these experiments were really crummy. They were done at 20 GeV, very low energy, low momentum transfer. But, you know, there's something very attractive about a new idea which somehow fits everything together and you can calculate. Of course, there's work to be done, papers to be written. So people started calculating. And there are a lot of applications, deep and elastic scattering, of course, which started the whole thing, E plus E minus annihilation, various um, phenomena and the weak decays. There are also theoretical advances pretty rapidly to try to understand especially this weird phenomena of confinement. I used to have argued, one of my senior colleagues at Princeton was Eugene Wigner. Eugene Wigner couldn't very strongly believe it made absolutely no sense to talk about theories in terms of particles that you couldn't produce, because he defined particles as asymptotic states, things that you could produce in the lab and would go off themselves as irreducible unitary representations of Poincaré group. So trying to define part of theory in terms of quarks and gluons that would never get out made no sense to him. <laughs> anyway, one, some of the developments have dominated the field forever. Uh, one is lattice gauge theory, which Wilson immediately uh, developed, which allows you to start solving QCD numerically and gives you a picture of what strong coupling confinement would look like. Uh, Andre Nouveau and I solved a two-dimensional model which produced a mass gap, which I'll be discussing dynamically, very instructive for me. And at Hooft, uh, studied two-dimensional QCD, where confinement is trivial in a way. The linear potential is automatic in perturbation theory, but it therefore, for large N QCD, SUN gauge group, provides a soluble model of confinement. And for me, that was enormously reassuring that, unlike what Wigner thought, it made sense to talk about a relativistic quantum field theory in which the constituents, the quarks, the gluons, are not asymptotic states, are confined. But the real dramatic event, as always in physics, is experiment. And <laughs> there was the following fantastic development in the early 70s. Now, one consequence of scaling, especially asymptotic freedom QCD, was a prediction of what the, this is the ratio of total annihilation cross-section of electron-positron to hadrons compared to electron-positron annihilation to leptons, to electron-positron. That measures how many charged particles there are point-like charged particles there are. We knew there were three quarks, three colors, so one could predict what that looked like. And that was one of the, among the rest, experimental motivations for three colors. And it worked. But see here, the new, again, the new machine at SLAC, the electron-positron storage ring, which collided electrons and positrons together at high energies, this is GeV. Um, it just turned on, and they observed this deviation from the prediction of three quarks. And I remember well uh, a meeting at the ICTP, Trieste, in 74, the spring of 74, where Richter talked about this result and announced that QCD, I don't think he knew what QCD was, but scaling was dead. All these ideas of theorists were wrong. Cross-section was increasing. Now, some of us knew that there had to be more quarks. 
And Lee and Gayard essentially know, you know, told this commu experimental community that they should be discovering charm and so on, Apoquist in Georgia and Pollitzer. But uh, theorists were very timid in those days because they were just beginning to be successful. And of course, after Richter said everything is dead, a few months later, indeed, he discovered the J. Psi had been discovered by Ting. And this indeed was not the death of QCD, but rather a threshold for charmed quarks. So there was one more quark. Not only that, because you could use perturbation theory at high energies, you could actually understand the plethora of charmonium states. Charm, anti-charm, atoms, if you want. Great success as opposed to death of QCD. And that convinced lots of other people that this perhaps was the right track. And the story, of course, of E plus and minus annihilation as a way to see new quarks has continued, also new vector bosons, weak interactions. That was a very interesting episode. What about the real prediction, the main prediction of, of uh, QCD, namely that the coupling gets weaker and weaker as you go to higher energies? Well, this is 1989. These are the experiments, big error bars, but it seems to work. And you can measure the coupling, which is determined in QCD, the strength of the coupling. It looks here like it's, you know, 1%. I don't believe this, actually, because, in fact, straight line looks like it fits pretty well, given the error bars. Very hard to test precisely the prediction. The, you know, precise predictions of QCD because the coupling only gets weaker logarithmically and logs take a long time to build up. <laughs> this is today much better. I think this is the latest fit I can find. I'm sure John could tell me there's a better fit, but this is truly better than 1%, maybe a half a percent determination. All of these different experiments are fit by a coupling that runs, that varies with scale, according to QCD, uh, with errors of less than a percent now. But not only that, there's so many other things you can calculate. Any high energy process, although many takes, took a lot of work to uh, define the right observables that made sense. And now we have, these are the tests of the deviations from scaling, from straight lines. Uh, at the latest, I think this is just about the end of Hera. There will be a new deep and elastic scattering machine coming online pretty soon, uh, which will be fantastic, especially in the small X region. And then, of course, LHC, which in some sense is primarily, aside from discovering the Higgs and creating this lecture, um, is, tests, observes and detests uh, QCD processes, which fit with unbelievable experimental advances and theoretical advances uh, I don't know, to the better than 1% level, right? Is, is it, in some cases, better, uh, a tenth of a percent, maybe? Just recently, there came out the results in Atlas, which uh, measures our press with a higher precision than all the previous world data. Really? I, I, you have to give me the reference, because I could use And what, the errors are at what level now? So that's still one part in a thousand of point one. It's still one percent-ish. 
it's really, yeah, it's a little bit better, maybe half a percent, but it's really hard to, because of the logarithmic. Uh... Now, but the real goal, the thing that you really want if you have a theory of nucleons is to understand nucleons, in particular, calculate their masses. And then you really have to control this complicated vacuum, which is strongly interacting. And the only real precise tool we have is lattice gauge theory. You put the theory on a lattice. The static properties of nucleons, of hadrons, you can write down the answer. It's just, trouble is, it's a million dimensional integral, which is hard to calculate. And then you have to take the limit as it becomes an infinite dimensional integral. But lattice QCD over the last 40 years, 50 years almost, has, become, has reached an incredible level of maturity due to technology, Moore's law, computers, as well as a lot of theoretical ingenuity. And we can now calculate the mass spectrum of the observed hadrons, again, to a, about the level of 1% from first principles with almost no parameters. You can even calculate the neutron-proton mass difference. You have to include electromagnetism, but that can be done easily. Uh, and it's a remarkable, remarkable yeah. Also, to do this, do those comparisons with LHC data, you need a lot more than just what we calculated, the first term in the beta function, which told you the leading behavior of how the coupling decreases at high energy. And those have been calculated way beyond third order. I've stopped here. The formulas get quite complicated. <laughs> NF is the number of quarks, number of flavors. So we, at the time, uh, knew of up and down and strange quarks. Um, as long as they're fewer than 16, or 17, are quarks, you still get asymptotic freedom. Not if they're too many, because then the screening wins out over the anti screen. And in addition, the development of per calculating perturbation theory to very high orders in non abelian gauge theory, which is a, a priori seems impossibly difficult, has now become quite easy. And one can calculate not just the leading order terms, which you know, we could initially calculate quite easy, one loop diagrams, next to leading order, next to next to leading order, next to next to next to leading order. And a lot of this accuracy is needed to uh, confront LHC. Now, I want to end by discussing the remarkable properties of QCD, which I denote here as a perfect theory in the following sense. First of all, there are no infinities. These the infinite quantities that bugged people from the beginning of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory aren't there at all. Second, there are no adjustable parameters, more or less. Everything can be calculated. And finally, there's no physics at arbitrarily high energies and short distances. I'm just discussing QCD by itself. So what does it mean to say that there are no infinities? If you actually do perturbation theory in QCD, you'll, you'll, there'll be infinities along the way, but they're totally unphysical. And that's clear if you look at, um, well, so the bare coupling, the thing that in QED led Landau to conclude quantum field theory was nonsense, their verge was infinite. But not in QCD, it's zero. The only time you encounter infinities is if you try to express observables at finite distances in terms of those you measure at arbitrarily small distances. You might therefore divide by zero to get an infinity, but it's not physical. In lattice gauge theory, you define the theory on a lattice with a cutoff the size of the lattice A. Your coupling depends on A. 
characterizes the strength of the coupling at distance A. You write down finite in a finite volume, a finite dimensional integral. You calculate it by Monte Carlo. You take the, let A go to zero. And when you do that, the coupling vanishes like logarithmically. <laughs> and if you take this, you know, this behavior, plug it into here, take the limits, you get a finite answer for the mass of all the hadrons you might study. You never get infinities. No need for renormalization if you want. This is the renormalized coupling. So there are no UV divergences. Nothing to worry about. More importantly, the second feature is the theory can calculate everything. So I, recently I read uh, Feynman's beautiful summary on the present status of quantum electrodynamics, the Solvay Conference in 1961, right after the great success of renormalization theory and QED. <laughs> Feynman summarized all that, and then he asked, QED has two parameters, the mass of the electron, the fine structure constant. I want to calculate them. Can I calculate them? Is there any way, he says, well, the simplest way to calculate them would be to put the mass of the electron to zero and then somehow get it by some principle. So he considered pure QED with zero mass electrons and photons, interacted with no other particles. He knew there were other forces, of course, in nature, having no cutoff energy arbitrarily high energies, he says, cannot produce a finite electron mass. Now, of course, there's a symmetry when the electrons are massless, chiral symmetry, which would keep the electron massless. Feynman already, 1961, knew that problem could be solved by spontaneous symmetry breaking. He references Nambu. But here he was trying to get a mass of the electron, which he realized was also protected by scale invariance. So if you have pure QED with no mass, there's no scale. The theory is scale invariant. And if the theory is invariant to a change of scale, there's no parameter to determine the length. So an electron with mass involves such a length. I'm not certain, he says. Feynman was always careful. It appears to me impossible to generate a specific length from <coughs> no scale whatsoever. QCD, however, does that. Quantum effects break scale invariance. We saw screening or anti-screening have scale dependence, force changes with scale, with distance. Quantum effects break scale invariance can produce a mass scale, a dynamical mass, and determine the coupling as well. So QCD, in a sense, is a perfect theory. And has, let's take QCD, massless quarks. By the way, that doesn't change the world very much. The level of 1 to 10 percent quarks are very light. Make a massless. Theory has no length scale it would appear, and a coupling, the strength of the coupling. It also has quark masses in the real world. The number of colors is three, but let's take those as given. And then there's the phenomena we call dimensional transmutation. So I have one slide which explains this analytically. I'm going to go through it very fast since I'm running out of time. You actually, to define the theory, you need to introduce some scale, like in the lattice, the lattice spacing, where you define what you mean by the coupling. So the coupling, say, is the strength of the force between two particles at some distance, say, 1 over mu. 
the renormalization group, the theory, the dynamics determines how that coupling depends on the scale you've introduced. You make that scale bigger, the coupling is going to be smaller. That depends on the sign of this beta function. Now, any physical quantity can't depend on this arbitrary scale that you've introduced to define the theory. And that's what this equation tells you. A physical quantity depends on this arbitrary scale because, you know, explicitly, but also because the coupling depends on the scale. So if you know this function, you can solve. And a physical mass that doesn't depend on really on mu, has, th has this form, where the mu dependence explicit in the dimension, this is mass, this is mass, is compensated for by the mu dependence of the coupling that's defined at that scale. Notice, by the way, in an asymptotically free theory for small g, this has a typical non-perturbative-ish behavior for small g. For a non-asymptotically free theory, it's crazy. Small g, mass would blow up. Such theories are probably not sensible if you regard them as they can't dynamically generate masses. But this means that if you say, generate a mass, which you could, this, because of this scale not invariance of the vacuum, then any physical object that you can measure has some dimension, engineering dimension. So it must be this thing to the dth power, d is the dimension, and c must be a pure number that you can calculate. So that means that any physical quantity in units of this mass, any mass that exists in a theory, like if there exists a proton, you could take its mass as defining the scale of mass or length, <coughs> and all mass ratios are calculable. So the proton, for example, which is you know, a region of space where the quarks are confined, what defines that size is where the coupling becomes strong. And the mass is just the energy of the confined quarks and gluons uh, confined in this space, which you can then calculate. And um, I always like to say that you know, if you gain a pound of weight, You've really, of mass, you've gained a pound of energy. Because most of your energy is the kinetic energy of the confined gluons and quarks rattling around inside the nucleon. But then, the, at that distance scale, the size of the proton, the coupling is determined. So John just told us the coupling, alpha s, at the scale of the z boson has been measured to better than a percent. It's a calculable number. It's what Feynman wanted, to be able to calculate the fine structure constant. QCD, fine structure constant, 0.1-ish at the z mass scale is calculable. So that's what I mean by a perfect theory. The amazing, in my opinion, still amazes me that you can have a theory which everything, all dimensionless, physical, the measurable objects can be calculated. No input. Except, of course, for the small quark masses, except, of course, for the number of colors. That has to be given. Why? We don't know yet. Finally, it's a perfect theory because there's no new physics. You know, look at the theory. It doesn't break down, no matter how high the energy is, how short the distances are. <laughs> to the contrary, it becomes simpler and simpler, easier and easier to calculate. 
And that has had remarkable implications. One of the first things that happened was it enabled astrophysicists to start probing the early history of the universe. It led to, among the rest, and the rest of the standard model, to speculate and try to understand the unification of forces, and it solved Dirac's large number problem. So this really opened up the early universe for theoretical speculation, transforming it. You know, before the CMB, the universe was denser and hotter, strong in a you know, dense soup of hadrons or quarks, but easy to study because the hotter, higher energy, denser, the easier QCD becomes. Instead of a hadron hell, which is what stopped people from trying to imagine studying cosmology before the CMB, uh, you had quark, a quark soup, which you could analyze. And interesting things happen when you go back in the universe to a denser and hotter state. We expect, actually, a quark gluon plasma, a deconfined phase of quarks. Protons melt. The quarks come out at very high temperatures or energies. Uh, they're a weakly interacting plasma. And as we have discovered experimentally at RIC and now at LHC, there is fascinating phase transitions and behavior of this uh, quark gluon plasma or quark gluon liquid. And much is yet to be discovered, which we don't have time to discuss. Now, finally, one could extrapolate the strong interactions now without easily or perturbatively to very high energies, as well as the other forces, which are weakly coupled already. The weak interactions get even weaker. Electromagnetism gets stronger. Maybe gets really bad, but way out here. And they seem to come together. A few years after the standard model was completed, this extrapolation took place, as you know, and led to the theoretical discovery that this unification of forces, there are more clues, but just to the strength of the forces, is sort of in the same region, more or less, within an order of magnitude or two, of where gravity, quantum gravity, becomes important. Of course, that has dominated our speculation for the last 45 years, led to string theory, and so on. Finally, one of the implications of, of this of asymptotic freedom is the large number problem which another Englishman formulated way back, where he noticed that there are very large numbers in physical measurable quantities which seem fundamental. For example, the ratio of the proton mass to the Planck mass is 10 to the minus 19. That's a very small number. Planck mass is the energy scale, the mass scale, where gravity becomes as important as the other forces. It's a very weak force at low energies. It grows quadratically with energy. How could you possibly calculate this number? Dirac noticed other large numbers. He didn't know how to calculate them. He didn't assume how to calculate them. He just related them. By the way, he could have invoked anthropic arguments, but Dirac was Dirac. He didn't do that. But what he did do was relating various numbers of this order of magnitude, for example, the ratio of the size of the observed universe to the size of the atom, also this order. That varies with time. So he concluded that fundamental parameters, perhaps Newton's constant, fine structure constant, vary with time. That could be experimentally checked. We have very old nuclear reactors that have been around for billions of years underground. It's not true, as far as one knows. 
But QCD can calculate this in a way. Because the coupling goes down. And now, at very high energies, we have every expectation, speculation, that the forces unify at around the Planck scale. So this is the Planck scale. And now you ask, OK, if we start with a coupling which is you know, of the order of the fine structure constant, something like that, here at the Planck scale, what determines the mass scale of the proton? Well, the force gets bigger and bigger. Finally, you can't pull the quarks apart. That defines the size of the proton and thereby the mass of the confined quarks. That gives you the proton mass. And of course, the ratio is just this e to the minus 1 over g squared I showed you before for a small coupling. And that is easily, in fact, using what we know about the world, roughly the order of 10 to the minus 19, where 19 might be plus or minus 2. But that really is why the proton is so light compared to the Planck mass, while why stars are so big, contain so many protons before they become black holes, why we aren't black holes. So QCD is the first example of a complete theory if you ignore everything else. No adjustable parameters, no indication of a distance scale where it must break down. Quite remarkable, infinite bandwidth. But of course, the real world has parameters, the number of colors, the quark masses and mixing, gravity, the weak interaction, electromagnetism so on. But in of itself, we have this perfect theory. Now, the other important, most important, perhaps, aspect of QCD is string theory. These flux tubes look like fat strings. In fact, that's how string theory developed in order to explain hadronic scattering amplitudes, which had various features which, in some sense, could be explained by strings. So these flux tubes in string theory are strings with quarks or labels attached to the ends. But one of the most remarkable developments in string theory, which was originally a theory of the strong interactions, was the discovery that an open string could be closed, and closed strings were gravitons. So this development. Happened, happened over the years and continues to be the most promising development of trying to unify particles and gravity. Um, and there are ways to try to use this insight, which I don't really have time to describe, so I won't. Mm. So. There are limits of QCD if you change the number of colors where the string theory picture should become better and better. There is, within string theory, a remarkable duality between closed and open strings, or quantum field theory and string theory. And the continual hope is that not that we're going to solve QCD. That's too hard. But one could hope that one could perhaps solve the supersymmetric version of QCD, which is dual to a string theory, and then deform it to QCD. There are other hopes in which one could, especially for large numbers of colors or in a 1 over 3 expansion, analytically understand the large scale behavior of QCD. So let me say a few words about the future. There's bound to be enormous development, remarkably, in the structure of perturbation theory. This was really unanticipated, certainly by me, that these amplitudes would show such remarkable mathematical properties, hinting perhaps at something deep, 
still not understood, but very useful. Numerical methods like lattice gauge theory, but now more and more approaches like Hamiltonian truncation or quantum computers that might enable numerical control of real-time non-static properties of hadrons. Fragmentation, diffraction, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, perhaps most importantly, there are no experiments and no facilities coming online. LHCB has discovered lots of new hadronic, uh, multi, very interesting quark states. Not just quark anti quark or three quarks like the pion and the proton, but tetraquarks and pentaquarks. Very interesting and not very well understood. Alice, like Rick, can pro and other um, facilities can probe dense, high temperature um, ion, heavy ion collisions and produce this deconfined quark gluon fluid and eventually plasma. And uh, this can also be perhaps uh, probed by observing, and now we have new ways of observing the, di uh, the insides of neutron stars, which in their deep core might exhibit different phases of nuclear nucleons of QCD. And deep and elastic scattering, which started this game, now is going to have a new facility, the uh, electron ion Collider, very large momentum transfer, which is being built at Brookhaven, and uh, will probe again this, not just the structure of the nucleon, uh, way beyond Hera or Slack, but also the structure of nuclei, and uh, give an impetus to using QCD to understand nuclear physics. Well, nuclear physics is just quarks and gluons. So let me end with uh, the following. Feynman was one that once wrote a summary of physics at his time uh, in one sentence. He said, if so in some cataclysm all scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, may be made out of silicon. What statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? This is a very interesting challenge. I challenge you to do better than Feynman. It's hard. And what Feynman said, I believe it's the atomic hypothesis, this or fact. All things are made out of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they're a little distance apart but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. That really is incredible. Try to do it. One sentence. It's so much of classical and quantum physics in some sense. Uh, uh, this hard to surpass. One sentence. I couldn't do it. I tried to do it for one slide. What have we learned from the standard model? to pass on to the AI computers that will replace it. <laughs> well, matter is, I'll try, I could actually, with commas I, and a lot of wind, I could do it in one sentence. Matter is made out of charged spin one half fermions with forces described by quantum gauge field theory, which can exist in three phases, electromagnetism in a Coulomb long range phase, the weak forces by an SU2 gauge theory, which is screened or Higgs by an unnatural scalar. That's a footnote. And the strong interactions by an SU3 gauge theory in a confining phase. So that's the standard model in one slide. 
What have we learned in 50 years from QCD? Well, most importantly, we've learned that QCD is the theory of the strong interactions. It works. And we've learned, I think, the most important thing is that dynamics, quantum dynamics, can produce everything. Mass scale, length scale, and couplings, leaving nothing that you cannot calculate, except the number of colors, the number of spatial, you know. We have to get to that. And finally, perhaps, in retrospect, 50 years from now or 100 years from now, gauge string duality. The real hero of all of this is gauge theories, especially non-abelian gauge theories, which are secret of QCD, strong force, the weak force, and Maxwell's force, which is kind of the trivial case, but also string theory. These are really the same, it appears. And string theory is beginning to teach us about quantum gravity and space-time itself. So that's the end, but not really. Not the end of QCD. Thank you. So oh, thank you very much, Professor Gross, for this uh, tour de force, this, uh, this journey through uh, the discovery of QCD. Um, we are running a bit over, so if people need to leave, they can go. But we are going to do some questions. So has anybody got any questions for Professor Gross? Could you get the microphone to that gentleman there? Thank, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I have one question, though. At, near the end of your talk, you were talking about string theory. And um, the I'm, you were talking about string theory. And I'm a little bit confused about the state of string theory given current experimental um, uh, experiments. Um, my understanding was that the Large Hadron Collider was built uh, to look for supersymmetry, the underlying things for string theory. No, it was built um, for the Higgs. For the Higgs, but, the, I mean, but we wanted to find new things. We knew and, there was the Higgs. We wanted new things. Yeah. But we couldn't find anything new. So, so far. OK. Um, but does this mean that there's any hope in string theory if supersymmetry no, doesn't theory, apply uh, right in the, any of the yeah. energy ranges we're interested in? Supersymmetry plays a very important role in string theory. Um, but doesn't particularly pick out a scale. The, the motivation for hoping, speculating, maybe even and expecting uh, that supersymmetry would show up at the LHC were various uh, clues from nature. Dark matter, low mass Higgs, et cetera, et cetera. The naturalness of the Higgs. Unification gets better and better if you um, assume low energy. Low en by low energy, I mean TV scale supersymmetry. So there are various clues from experiment, phenomenology, like the existence of dark matter, uh, that suggested that supersymmetry could help understand those experimental facts. And that was motivation. But string theory does not require uh, super low energy supersymmetry. The, scale, the natural scale for string theory as a fundamental theory of gravity, okay, not the string theory I'm talking about, by the way. You know, uh, those flux tubes, see, forget about fundamental string theory. Those flux tubes are you imagine a world, you, again, you have to slightly change the real world. In the real world, strings break. You nucleate 
quark and antiquark pairs is that flux do breaks. You can't really pull them apart arbitrarily. But if you didn't have that problem, if you had no quarks and you just pulled external quarks apart, you'd get an infinitely long string. And all of our understanding of, of physics would tell us that there's a way of describing that in terms of some kind of dynamics of a, an extended object. So that's what we're looking for in the case of QCD. It's not this theory, it's not directly the theory which exhibits gravity. There clearly are no gravitons uh, in this quark, anti-quark, or closed loops of flux in QCD. Okay? But the two, but you know, these are related kinds of theories. There's a lot of evidence from not just from the lattice, where you are allowed to remove the quarks and you just have these flux tubes. You can do those calculations on the lattice and actually compare them with what, by general principles, we understand an effective string theory would look like. It's not the same, and no supersymmetry occurs. And so it's just a different way of understanding QCD. Now, there is this so-called ADS-C, ADS-CFT duality, which tells us that if we supersymmetrize QCD, especially for a large number of colors, it really is a fundamental string theory. But that's not QCD. It's scale invariant, for example. It does not produce a dynamical mass scale. And in the bulk, the theory, this supersymmetric version of QCD is dual to, there is gravity, there are black holes. The black holes are related, by the way, to these, what happens when you collide heavy ions together, you produce this, this uh, hot fireball. That's very similar to a black hole. In fact, in ADS-CFT, they're identical. And so you learn a lot about black holes. You learn a lot about gravity. To go from there to QCD, you need to deform the theory, decouple various sectors, get rid of supersymmetry, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a theoretical hope. As far as supersymmetry goes, LHC, we still hope. You know, LHC is now running with an much higher luminosity. There'll be a lot more events. Subtle effects, subtle phenomena might reveal supersymmetry. Right, John? Might. Might. <laughs> so people, you know, we're much less dogmatic now. <laughs> We've learned our lesson. Theorists are. But, uh, but it could happen. There's nothing that's quite, quite possible. But it really has nothing to do with what I was talking about doesn't have to do with the QCD string or the real hopes of string theory, which is not, well, supersymmetry. If, if string theory eventually, string theory, by the way, is a very bad word. If, the, if this approach, string framework, is what I call it, uh, turns out to be the secret to a lot of these big questions, then supersymmetry at some scale is probably inevitable but not low energy, necessarily. Any more questions? Hello. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm a first year undergraduate student. Frankly, I'm confused most of the time. And <laughs> I, would, I would quite like to know, what do you, what's the first thing that you do when you don't know something? Uh, well, first thing you do is ask your tutor or advisor whether she knows the answer. What do you do? What do I do? Um, well, I try to understand. I mean, there are different ways of trying to approach questions you don't know the answer to. They're usually from the side. 
It's very difficult because normally you use the same old methods, <laughs> which don't work, and uh, which everyone else uses. And, and so you have to find some new angle. Uh, I grew up in a period where experiment really provided that clues that were either unavoidable or you could, could point to some direction if you were lucky or smart enough to figure out where they were pointing. It's not always easy. We don't live in that. Well, there are experimental that are clearly uh, pointing in some direction, but we don't. So you, those you need to take very seriously. Questions that theorists pose, um, and you don't know the answer, it's probably a good idea to try a different, try to invent a different approach. Uh, especially since if you try to do what everyone else is trying to do, you're very likely to get scooped, even if it turns out to be the right way to go, which it usually isn't. So I don't have any advice beyond that. Thank you. So no chat GBT. <laughs> uh, you could try that. It won't lead you very far. I mean, <laughs> Thank you. It won't even give you interesting uh, new ways to think about it. I, I would keep a very open mind, be open to anything that sounds interesting. Uh, it's all right. Thank you. I would try, but. Do we have any more questions? Everyone's tired. No. If not. Uh, you were talking about um, the early universe and uh, mm -hmm. things emerging from the furnace. I believe uh, Nadav has something which emerged from the furnace in his back garden, uh, which is a traditional thing now to present to people who give the Higgs lecture. Uh, so, ah, yeah. Yes, so small. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. So I have a bunch of these for you. <laughs> <laughs> Some of, them are, some of them are broken, <laughs> <laughs> so I could always use them. So can we all please uh, give a big round of applause for what was a very nice talk? Thank you.